the world that we live on is 25,000 miles in circumference. That means if we set Daz driving at 70 miles an hour in a straight line and we point him in the right direction to avoid various places at the moment, it would take him 15 days to get back to us. It, it is said or estimated to be six sextillion tons in weight. And if, you, if you're not sure what a sextillion is, well, basically it's six and 21 zeros. But we're growing because we're hit by 40,000 tons of space debris every year. As we sit here now, if you're feeling dizzy, there may be a reason for that in that, in fact, on the surface of the planet, as the planet spins, we are moving at a thousand miles per hour. It's even more dizzying than that, because if we're moving uh, at that because of the, the way that the Earth spins, in fact, as we travel through space, we're traveling at 67,000 miles an hour. The planet is home to 7.9 billion of us. If plan goes well, by the time I sit down, there'll be another 6,000. It's estimated that the planet is home to 8.7 million species of animal, only which 2,000 of we, we have actually documented and got to grips with. Now, if, if you like, Anna, and you don't like a good statistic, what I'm trying to say is this, that the, the planet on which we live does its job with breathtaking precision. It's one of a kind. It's the right size, it's got the right angle, the right orbit, it's rotating and traversing at the right speeds, it has the right atmosphere. And for all those reasons, you and I have an amazing home in which to live. And scientists are only really just discovering, well, what, what it's doing, and there's, there's so much more for them to discover. Of course, while the Bible doesn't claim to be a science book, um, as somebody who loves science, I'm always intrigued to look back at what the, uh, that those who were involved in writing the Bible, being inspired by God, actually wrote about the place on which they live. And some of the things that those characters wrote, being instructed to do so by God, actually proved to be way ahead of their time. So the Bible wasn't written to tell us about planet Earth, and yet, those who, the, the words which we have recorded do reflect some of the things that we've subsequently discovered. Well, maybe that's not going to work. Oh, no, it won't work because I put my doodle out, my dongle in. Sorry. This is where the whole thing now falls apart. Yes. So here's a quote from a, a man called Job, one of the earliest books in the Bible, uh, one of the earliest characters that God inspired to write things down on his behalf. And he wrote 3,700 years ago, there or thereabouts, he stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. It's amazing that when you think about the time at which these words were committed uh, to, to a medium for us to read now, no mention you notice of an atlas or of a, of a, a rhinoceros or a, a, um, somebody's great shoulders that we are balancing on. No, Job wrote down that we are, we are hanging on nothing. Isaiah in 700 BC, there or thereabouts, wrote, it is he who sits about the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. That, that's amazing. Anybody know who is attributed with saying for the first time that the earth was round? Pythagoras, Greek mathematician, 500 BC. Isaiah wrote this in 700 BC. And whilst Isaiah was not writing to inform us that the earth was round, he got the detail right. He continues, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Now, 1929, a little bit more recent than Isaiah, was when Hubble discovered or, or floated the idea that the universe is continuing to expand. And yet Isaiah, the words of Isaiah 40 actually are written in a way which accommodates that rather more recent discovery. Continues. <clears throat> He has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light 
and darkness. Now, of course, it would be the very moment when that circle disappears off the screen. But when it comes back, you'll remember that, in fact, as night and day, the boundary of it between uh, night and day moves across uh, the, the face of our spherical Earth. It's called the it Terminator, by the way, this, this semicircular or circular line. Well, what Job wrote, I think I managed to stop it there. What Job wrote managed to accommodate it. This is a, another example from Job. He draws up the drops of water. They distill his mist in rain, which the skies pour down and drop on man abundantly. That was the 17th century when the scientists actually caught up with Job and, and concluded that rain comes from the earth, that it is lifted up and then it is dispelled and displaced uh, and comes back to us. As I said, though, the Bible isn't written as a science book. That, that wasn't the purpose. The purpose of the Bible actually was to tell us why. Why God would consider it worthwhile to put such a, a place together. Revelation, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And so whilst the Bible might be accurate and able to accommodate the science, now it steps into a different realm. Science doesn't tell us why we're here. It might tell you what, what it is that we're here on, or might try to, but the Bible steps in and tells us why. God, God put us here for his pleasure, but not just so that we'd make him happy. He, he, he designed planet Earth so that it might be inhabited. Thus says the Lord who created the heavens. He is God who formed the earth and made it, he established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. And so when we open the pages of, of the Bible, we're opening pages which God has seen fit to, to, uh, to uh, bring together over thousands of years as he's worked with different characters. And when we read what he committed to paper for us, we find out why he's done what he's done and why we are where we are on an amazing planet, not, not just to marvel at the science, but actually to, to, well, to look around us and to ponder who put us here and why. <clears throat> something else, that, the, that is something else that the world was designed to do, of course. It does read it in Acts chapter 17. Come back with me there if you wish to. Remember, in Acts chapter 17, we have the Apostle Paul addressing the, well, the geniuses of his day. So Athens was where many uh, clever people had um, come together. They, they pondered all sorts of things, and, and Paul took the opportunity to introduce them to this concept that the planet on which they lived was, in fact, designed by God for them. But more, it was designed by God to cause them to think about the world in a particular way. Acts 17, verse 22, Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Him, therefore, whom ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, well, if not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And the message that the Apostle Paul delivered to the, the creme de la creme of his day then are, you can't put God in a box. You can't keep him restricted to a certain um, space or time. He's done that to you. He's put you in this specific place, and you can't get off. And you're here for a, a particular time. And you don't know how long that is, but he's done it so that you might think, why? 
So, so the place is designed to, to make us wonder why we're here. And actually, it's more than that. So Paul assures these men of Athens that if they look, they will find evidence of God in the things that they see as they look around them. And Paul isn't the only one who concludes that. That, again, is a principle in the Bible. So, so Job, talking about the beasts uh, <clears throat> and the, the birds of the air, he he tells us that, that they actually know who put them here. Ask the beasts, they will teach you. The birds of the heavens, they will tell you. Or the bushes of the earth, they will teach you. The fish of the sea will declare to you who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? We think we're very clever, don't we? We're, we're pondering and we're developing, we're um, investigating all sorts of things. And yet Job writes a long time ago, actually, the animal kingdom knows why it's here. Uh, maybe there's a Bible class in that for you, Daz. I, I don't know. But it's amazing, isn't it, that, that Job would kind of simplify things down to, that don't be too clever about this. And it's not just an Old Testament theme either. Romans, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that he has made. And the idea then is that as we look around the world in which God has placed us, the world that he has created, in fact, all around us is evidence of him and of his plan. Of course, the Bible goes further than just that. Because it tells us that of all that God has created, human beings are the most well-equipped to search him out in the world in which they find themselves. So right at the beginning, when um, the, the Bible introduces us to the, the idea that God placed us here, that it does it in such a way as to, to emphasize that men and women are most like the Lord God who has created all of this. God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. The Bible doesn't waste any words. So that's not the same thing, image and likeness. The, the idea of image is that we, we look like angels can look, messengers of God. Likeness is, is not looks, it's thinking. So we can think in a manner which will allow us to search out the Lord God in all that is uh, around us in the world that he's created. Genesis 1 continues to describe why men and women were made like this. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And when you look at dominion, it wasn't that men and women should go around uh, basically saying, I'm the boss. You will do what I tell you to do, you animal kingdom, you. Because when we, we look into Genesis 2 and, and the description of what that meant, it was about having responsibility. So we're told the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Actually, those words are better translated to serve it and to guard it. That there was a responsibility which God gave the human race to look after that which he had created. That that is one of the, the simplest messages of the word that God has seen fit to prepare for us. Of course, during the course of history, the human race has done amazing things with the world in which we find ourselves. You think of the developments in science and medicine, culture, business, construction, and you look at the ordinary stuff that people are now able to do. I can't remember when the first man uh, summited Everest. It wasn't that long ago, probably in Daz's lifetime at least. But now you look at, well, this was a picture from a, a couple of years ago of the queue of normal, ordinary men and women to reach the summit of the tallest mountain on earth. Of course, that, that might be an amazing, um, a, an amazing achievement, but scratch the surface and look at what we're really doing with this earth, which God has made us responsible for, and it's not such a great picture. That, that's a picture of the, the rubbish dump that is at base camp 
of Everest. So all of those people who are queuing are leaving uh, hundreds of tons, which the Nepalese government are scratching their heads as how to get back down the hill, you might imagine. But, but it's not just them. It's not just the luxury holidays. It's all of us. Wherever we are in the world, the, the, the problem that this world is facing in trying to accommodate us, this planet, is, is of mind-blowing proportions. So uh, the National Geographic, a um, couple of years ago, now October 2020, predicted that in the next 10 years, the plastic that slides into our waterways will reach 22 million tonnes per year. Uh, and it's not just our pollution. It, the whole planet is starting to struggle with what we've been doing with it for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. Our, our greatest threat in thousands of years is how David Attenborough uh, described the threat of global warming, which is all um, forcing us to, to consider battery-powered cars, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, these are worrying things. And people are getting worried. I didn't realize they did a survey on how worried people were in the UK and in the world. Every three months, Moray, Ipsos Murray go out and ask people what they're worrying about. And I had a look at what people were worrying about. This is actually from when I spoke with you last, there or thereabouts, a few months after. I think I was here in March 2019. And then this is what we were worrying about. Crime and violence, healthcare, poverty, social inequality, climate change. So it is something that is worrying people, that terrorism. Because the, the reality is living on planet Earth means that what we worry about changes. What's the big, uh, the, the big worry that's not there? COVID, yeah, of course. But back then when I came with you last, nobody had any idea what COVID was. So you look at what people are worrying about in February this year, and it's changed quite considerably. So coronavirus now at the top of everybody's worry list. Inflation, financial and political corruption has shuffled up there. I don't know why that could possibly be. Uh, and, and so it continues to change. Actually, it all depends where you live as well. So this is what we're worrying about in the UK. And yet on a worldwide wide scale, whilst some of the things we worry about are the same as other occupants of the planet, others are not. Uh, and so de depending on where we are, depend, it, it means that we, we might worry about different things. Of course, that was February. It, amazing that the Ukraine isn't on there yet, but I guess there's a bit of a lag. It'll be there, I imagine, in three months' time. Certainly political security will be right up there amongst the, the big worries that people might have. Of course, what, what the world at large fails to appreciate is that in the Bible, not only does it explain why we are here, but it also gives us an idea as to why God made the world like he did, so that things might go wrong from time to time. And there are some very relevant problems which are addressed in God's words. It becomes clear that God has a history of allowing the world which he has created to display his displeasure with what's happening in the world which he has created. This is something that Isaiah wrote back in 700 BC, you remember? The earth mourns and withers, the world languishes and withers, the highest people of the earth languish, the earth lies defiled under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. You wonder if that's a reference to, well, the responsibility that God gave the human race right back in the beginning, Genesis 1 and 2. And now Isaiah observes, being guided by God, that, that the state of the world reflects the state of the lives that people are living. Therefore, as a result of the lives that are being lived, a curse devours the earth. Its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. The inhabitants of the earth are scorched and few men are left. It's quite relevant, isn't it, to, to the concerns that David Attenborough and the like are, are having us to imagine rather than sticking our heads in the sand and thinking it'll be okay. And it wasn't just Isaiah. Hosea, another prophet, had a similar sort of message. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. The Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love 
and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed flow, follows bloodshed. Therefore, the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish, and also the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. And you listen to the, um, the, the geologists and the, the naturalists of, of this time, and, and you realize that that Hosea, the picture that he paints, is one that the world is facing right now. And it becomes clear, as I said, that, that some of the state of the world has to do with the way God feels about how the world has been treated and the lives which men and women have lived upon it. It's perhaps in the New Testament where the parallels between the, the world in which we live uh, and the, the, the way in which the Bible predicts the world will become become most apparent. When Jesus was asked, what, what will the, the world look like when the time comes for you to return? He said, well, a collection of things which, which look so familiar when we look around in the world in which we live. Jesus said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places, famines and pestilences. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. And I don't tell you, I don't need to tell you about the wars that are going on. Uh, I think Oxfam at the moment say 30 million people are facing famine. South Sudan, Somalia, Yemen, Nigeria, let alone Ukraine. Uh, and coronavirus has grabbed the headlines, as I said, isn't it? These pestilences as as Jesus has it back in Luke. Well, now the, the statistics which we are um, presented with on a daily basis are just mind boggling. And we don't really know how it's going to end. We're like, what are we in now? The third wave? Seem, things seem to be getting back to normal. But if anything, the last couple of years has, has shown us how unpredictable life can be what is normal anymore of course it's amongst that sort of picture of violence and worry and threat and, and illness that, that jesus starts to to bring around the idea of his return there will be signs in the sun moon stars on the earth distress of nations and perplexity because of the roars of the sea and the waves people fainting with fear and foreboding for what is coming on the world, for the power of the heaven will be shaken. But that's not a prelude to the, the ultimate destruction of the place. Actually, when you look at what the Bible predicts about the world in which we live and the trends which we might see, whilst people might be getting more and more worried about more and more things, in fact, what the Bible says is that, well, this will lead to something that will be welcome. Then will they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise up your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. So if the question is, what is the world coming to? The answer from a biblical perspective is this, that whilst things might deteriorate, so that the human race can't imagine a solution. And while some of the things that are going on in the world are definitely because of the way in which the world has been treated by its human population, in fact, all of these signs are indications that God's son is about to return. And when that happens, though there might be conflict and resistance, in fact, the intervention will be a positive one. That there are multiple references in God's words to a new heaven and a, a new earth. As the Bible looks toward the, the future, it looks to a time when the, the world will be, if you like, recreated. But, but it's not that it will be wiped away and that it will start again. When you look at, at these phrases, new heavens and new earth, it's not a brand new one. It's a renew a renewing of what God has already created. That's the idea that repeats and repeats, that God will intervene, and if you will, he'll clean the filters, 
he will service that which he has created and he will begin a, a new era. But the foundation will be that which is already in existence. And in God's word, we, we have a, a snapshot of what that might look like. It's Isaiah in particular, who is given a series of pictures of what the world will be like when God steps in and says, let's, let's refresh. And so we get the picture where disease and suffering will be addressed. But when children won't die anymore. When age, long life will, will be something which people can re rely upon. We get a picture of the, a place or a time when injustice and poverty and violence will be a thing of the past. We see at the moment on the news, don't we? So, so many millions of people being displaced from all they've ever known, all they've ever built up and invested and, and prepared for their family safety. And all of a sudden they've got to get up and they've got to go. And what might be there when they return might look nothing like what they're leaving now. And the Bible looks toward a time when that won't happen anymore. But, but rather, the world will be just. And violence will be a thing of the past. And ultimately, well, beyond that time, actually, God looks forward to a time and a place when he will be understood. That he won't just be observing that which he's created. He'll be He'll be more of a part of that which he's created. Not that he's not a part now. He is invested. He is involved. He knows what's going on. We know all of that from his word. And yet the last book of the Bible, as it looks to what will be, gives us a picture of something which is much more closely related to God being involved with his creation. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And what an answer that is to the pictures that we are seeing day in, day out in our papers and the TV at the moment of people who are losing and grieving and leaving all that they thought they could rely upon. And whilst the world may have got to a point where we can't imagine how to solve problems like Russia or problems like global warming, the message from God's word is this, that what's coming is a time when he will step in and, and he's the one who created it all in the first place and therefore can put it right again. And the challenge for us is, do we want to be part of that? And if we do, well, the challenge is to understand exactly what God has done, what he's doing, and what he will do. For, for there's an offer for each one of us that we can be part of it because of that which God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, did when he was here. And he will return again to take up the work and to, to make the world a different and a better place. Thank you.